Okay. So, today we are going to, you know, uh, finish the course. I mean, not really finish, but this is uh, the last big topic of the course, okay? Because uh, you remember that in the schedule we only have uh, uh, next week, Monday, uh, Firefox, uh, where we have, uh, let's say, a summary of things. Uh, um, uh, we will discuss uh, still a few things, but we will not implement anything more, okay? The slides are already online. There's some considerations about uh, security, a discussion about security of web applications in general. Then there are the labs, and only the last... Uh, lecture about how to design a solution of an application starting from scratch, starting from the text, okay, the assignment or the, the, the specifications, if you would like to call them uh, in this way, okay? Okay, so let's uh, move on uh, on the next, uh, last topic of, big topic of the course, which is authorization, okay? Shh. So, what's the difference between authorization and authentication that it is what we saw last time on Monday, okay? So, uh, well, um, yeah. Basically, authorization is about what you can do, okay? What you have permission to do. So, can you do the requested operation? That's the authorization. You're authorized to do something, okay? Authentication means... Uh, we know you are the one you, who you claims to be, okay? Okay, so today we are looking at authorization and how this can be implemented in web application. So first of all, before going on and discussing, um, you know, how to implement all this stuff, uh, we would like to uh, point out this fact, okay? Very simple, but very important also. There are two different approaches that you can use uh, to handle this authorization mechanism. So decide who uh, or uh, uh, if the requester is authorized to do something after you did authentication. So after you know who is requesting, uh, who is sending the request, okay? You can do as we did until now with stateful servers, okay? And we will uh, rehearse this a little bit in the next slides. And then you can do in the way we will uh, see today, which is uh, using a stateless server, okay? And why we are seeing this? Because this is often more common, in, especially in these modern web applications, single page application and so on, where you have to contact multiple servers and so on. So you cannot simply log in into different servers uh, uh, at the same time or different times, okay? So this is the approach that we saw on Monday, the classical one the, that has been in place uh, since uh, you started using, uh, we started using web applications in general, before single page applications and so on, okay? So there's a client and there's a server, and the server keeps uh, the state. So it means uh, when you authenticate, uh, <coughs> you create a session, there's a session ID, and this session ID is remembered, is stored by the server, okay? And together with this session ID, there is associated user info, okay? And last time, we saw there are functions, for instance, in Passport, where we can decide which information we would like to keep into the session, okay? And since this uh, information stays on the server, it cannot be maliciously altered. So an attacker cannot do anything, okay? Unless there's a bug in the server and you enter in the server and then, of course, you can do whatever you want, but not only <laughs> change things in a session, okay? But uh, in general, uh, this is not what is handled by your client application, which is the main topic of this course, because it stays on the server side, it never leaves the server. Okay, the trusted version of the information is only on the server. That can be a copy on the client, of course. We log in and they send, uh, the, the server sends us um, the information about uh, first name, last name, and so on. All this stuff is copied to the client. But the, 
trusted version of this information is always on the server. It's always available and can always be requested from the server. And so each time there's a new request that arrives uh, uh, for something which is not public, okay? So it needs to check for authentication and then authorization. The server retrieves the info associated with, se with the session. So that's the first thing that happens on the server. And then on the basis of this info that has in the session, so for instance, who is the user that originally authenticated in this session? It decides if it can answer the, requ the request or not, okay? Uh, so that's the idea. First time, the client sends uh, uh, the login request. Everything is fine, so the client uh, gets a session ID and the server stores it, okay? And then subsequent times, this, the client also sends the session ID to show the server that uh, the request uh, has been already authenticated. Okay, so it comes from a user that performed a login action before. And then, you know, in the, in the server, in the logic of the server, in the code, uh, the session ID is checked, and if everything is fine, so uh, the user who authenticated originally uh, can access the information, the information is returned by the server to the client. Okay, and this is fine, and that's what we saw on Monday, it works. Many websites use this approach because it's uh, conceptually simple and easy to handle in a certain sense. After you have the code that you implemented once, you can recycle it many times. It's not, net, not that difficult. Okay? Um, <coughs> and also it has its advantages. For instance, the trusted version of the data uh, associated with the session is only in the server. Okay, so it's not exposed to any attack. Okay, because it's in the server, it never leaves the server. I mean, the trusted version, just a copy might leave the server. Okay, but we can do different things. Okay, for instance, what do you think if I say that uh, we could have a, a trusted entity, uh, basically some, some code on some server, that will sign a payload which contains information about what can be accessed. So what you can do, the user info if it's needed, and when this uh, uh, authorization expires, okay? So it's more or less like uh, I give you, a f uh, I don't know, a piece of paper uh, that says uh, you are authorized to enter, you know, the I don't know, some restricted place, the, the department uh, for one week uh, starting today, and I sign it, okay? And you present it at the door to, to somebody who checks uh, who has the right to enter, and it reads the paper, it recognizes the signature, it, it recognizes what is written there, so you can enter, there's an expiration date, so you have uh, this uh, um, authorization uh, item that uh, allows you to prove that you are authorized to enter and then they le let you in, okay? And here, more or less, that's the same. So the client gets uh, this uh, payload, which is basically information. It's an object, uh, okay? A set of uh, key value pairs, uh, but it's signed. Okay, from this trusted entity, we'll discuss uh, in a minute what is this trusted entity. And then the client keeps it, like you keep it, uh, this uh, piece of paper that I just signed, and you keep it until it expires, okay? And each time, each time a request arrives for a restricted resource, the receiving server this time has nothing to keep on the server side. You just need to check the signature, okay? That's the payload, and you send both the payload, so the information about what you can access, for instance, and the signature. And then if the signature is valid, the server trusts what is written in the payload, so you can access this resource, you can access this place, and so on, and it gives you access, okay? And you recognize that in this uh, scheme, there's nothing that needs to be stored on the server side, okay? So 
That's why we say stateless server, because there's nothing that we, we need to store on the server side for uh, each authorization that we grant. Okay? So compared to the previous case where you need to store the session ID plus the information associated to that session, here you don't need to store anything because where is the information? The information is going back and forth with uh, this uh, payload, okay, which will be included in a small string okay, that contains both this payload, so what you're authorized to do, and a signature. Okay? Why is the signature needed? Because the server later, after granting the, um, the authorization, needs to be able to check the signature because it has no information on the server side. The only thing that, that it can do is check the signature, okay? Uh, so, in principle, the system is not that different, right? You get uh, a, a value, a secret value in the beginning, and then you, get, uh, you send it uh, together with your request. The difference is here on the server side, okay? Um, <coughs> okay. So, now that this approach, uh, where, by the way, the, the item that goes back and forth, we call, uh, we call it token, okay? That's a standard terminology in this uh, web application context. Uh, in this case, with the stateless server, this approach works uh, very well when you have uh, many servers, for any reason. Okay, we don't care, really care about the reason. It's because you would like to split uh, the load because you have uh, so many users. Okay, that's one possibility. It's because you would like to split uh, the task that each server is doing. One server is uh, dealing with uh, your bank account. The other server is dealing with uh, stock exchange uh, quotes. Uh, the other server is dealing with, uh, I don't know, other contextual information that you would like to have in this site and so on, okay? Uh, but every server needs to check if you are authorized to request uh, the information from them, okay? And if you have an approach like the previous one with a stateful server, it means that each server has to access the uh, session, the session information. So either is the session, inf either the session information is uh, shared between all servers, which starts to be complicated, okay? Or we need to have the information, the authorization information, coming from the client, okay? And also a way to check that this information is authentic, so has not been uh, tampered, has not been uh, changed. Okay, from when it was uh, granted initially. Okay, so with this uh, token approach, we solved two problems. Okay, we don't need to have all the servers uh, access uh, the a common storage where you keep the session ID plus the uh, information associated with the session. Okay, and also. Uh, <coughs> you uh, 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 don't require the client to do login requests, okay? Uh, for each different server you're going to ask or you're going to interact with, okay? Yes, that's a question, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, of course. An attacker can sign the, the signed token, of course. It can also read the, uh, the content of the payload, okay? Uh, but the same is true for the session ID. If the attacker can store, can steal, sorry, the session ID, it can steal the token. So the token is something to be kept secret as well, as is the session ID, okay? The point is that uh, uh, the attacker cannot simply write what he wants or she wants in the payload and then sign it, okay? I can create the token. The, the, the token format, we will see it. Uh, it's, uh, it's standard. There are many formats. We will see one, and it is the JVT, JWT. Uh, 
but the point is it's not able to sign it. Okay, so it can send uh, a request that says I'm authorized to do this, but it cannot create the signature. Okay? It can reuse the, yeah, the value, but that's true with the session ID as well. The session ID doesn't change uh, uh, when you have an active session, right? So that's exactly the, the same problem, right? So I'm not saying that the token solves the, the problem of keeping the value secret. I mean, the session ID secret or the, 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 the value of the payload plus signature uh, secret. Okay, I'm just saying that it's a, it's a different way of interacting with the server. So the server doesn't have to keep information about uh, uh, the status, the state, sorry, the state of the session, because there's no session, okay? The information that you would like to keep in the session, in the previous case, is in the payload of the token, okay? But of course, it's true what your colleague is saying, if an attacker has access to either the session ID or the token, of course, uh, we are screwed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, we, we, we should in some ways uh, uh, invalidate either the session ID or the token, okay? Uh, so they, uh, this is a, a, more, a, a, a way to make uh, interactions with many servers uh, more efficient, okay? It's not a way to make things more secure. They were secure with the session ID, they are secure with the token, okay? As long as session ID and the token are kept confidential, so are not uh, sniffed uh, in the network or not uh, leaked in some ways, okay? Okay, thanks uh, for, for the question. Okay, there are many, many different schemes to, to implement uh, even complex authorization flows. We are going to see a very simple one, but maybe you have heard about these uh, acronyms, OAuth, uh, SAML, OpenID, and stuff like that. They are all schemes based on tokens, okay? Uh, that involve typically more than two entities, okay? Because maybe there's a third entity that checks your identity and the fourth entity that checks uh, what this identity is allowed to do and so on. Okay, so there are tokens going back and forth between these entities with these uh, schemes, okay? Unfortunately, this is out of the scope of this course in the sense that it's relevant, but we have eight credits, not 12, not 16, okay? So we need to leave something out. But I would like to introduce you to the, um, to the tokens used as a way to uh, authorize some action from the point of view of the client. Okay, and uh, because uh, indeed uh, they are really useful and used uh, nowadays uh, um, when, uh, when you need to interact with many servers, okay? Uh, for this course, we will just uh, try to implement a simple example. As usual, today we will code a little bit with the starting, uh, from the starting point that already published on the GitHub. Uh, and we will use a token. So first of all, we will create it and use it uh, to access some restricted information from a server from which we don't have an active session, uh, va a valid session uh, active uh, with the server itself, okay? So we will uh, discuss uh, this example, okay? And then we will try to apply it uh, in a very simple case, like our toy application, the question and answers. And we will tell you what we will do with the token. So let's have a look at the, a very simple example. A, a classic single page application uses an API server to perform operations. Like think about uh, your bank uh, um, that is providing you, you know, the, the the single page application that allows you to check the balance and uh, use your bank account, okay? So, uh, they decided to develop it in React, let's suppose it, <laughs> okay? But I mean, uh, the bank is just an example, could be anything else, could be a, 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 an e-commerce website or the polytechnic website or any, any institution, okay? Uh, 
Um, so let's say uh, we would like to use uh, a, well, have a, a, a first server that is uh, the server with the API that does a bank transactions. Okay, so it, it gives you the balance and allows you to transfer money on this stuff. But also a second server where we would like to uh, allow our clients, I mean the bank's clients, uh, to access some additional information, which is typically not strictly related to what we are doing with the first server. Otherwise, probably we would implement it in the first server, okay, just for simplicity. For instance, in the case of the bank, for, uh, could be uh, like uh, access uh, no free stock exchange data, real time stock exchange data, for instance, okay? Could be like, uh, I don't know, uh, another website that allows you to access uh, very detailed uh, weather forecasts or w whatever you would like to do, okay? Uh, we don't really care about uh, what, what, what you request and what you get. We care about the authorization mechanism, okay? So for the first two servers, we already saw what we need to do. That's what we did on Monday. So we have a static uh, website that hosts the JavaScript code, the React JavaScript code. It serves the static page. The React um, code uh, is loaded and executed in the browser. And the browser then interacts with this API server. Okay? You have it in the lab. We have it during the lectures. Okay, we have two servers. One is the React development server, that is the one that is serving the static content in the beginning, and then we interact with the API server. And if we do uh, a, um, a login operation, so we um, authenticate ourselves, at a certain point we will have a session ID stored on the, on the browser with the cookie typically, as we did on Monday. And there will be the session ID stored on the server as well with the associated status information, okay? Yeah, for instance, who I am, okay? First name, last name, all this stuff. And bank account number, etc. But then I would like to interact with this third server. What should I do? I mean, what are these question marks means? What, what should I do? What's, what are the, the possibilities here? I don't want uh, to, to provide a free, uh, freely accessible API. If I would like to have a freely accessible API, this doesn't uh, matter. I mean, it's just uh, another server, you send a request and you get an answer, okay? We would like to have uh, an API that is uh, uh, giving information only to selected uh, requests, the requests that have been previously authorized, okay? So either I create a second session so it means the user has to enter something like user password again for this second server, and it creates another session. Or we share the session, but I already told you this is difficult and not very convenient, okay? Especially because this other server can be in a different network, a different infrastructure, and so on, okay? Or we try to use this approach that we already saw. Uh, that means this... Uh, Mm, uh, API server, the bank API server, the green one, gives you a token, this token, that you keep on the client side and you will send when you need to request information from the other server. Okay, so the server will recognize that uh, you are authorized to do uh, the request because the payload says that you are authorized to do a certain request and that's a signature coming uh, from the first server, okay? So that's the idea. The solution after the authentication, the server API bank.com provides a signed token that authorizes the client to access a non-free data from the other server, okay? So this uh, signed token. So in the end, there, there will be two pieces of information on the browser. One is the session ID, the one that we keep as a cookie, and the other is the signed token, which is basically another sort of random string that we will use to access uh, the other server, okay? So, in this case, it's true that something needs to be shared uh, between the two servers, but can be shared in a much easier way because it's just one shared secret for the whole set of users. Not uh, like we need to share 
each session, each valid session ID every time a new ID is created uh, and uh, when it's uh, uh, deleted, so it's removed and the session is not valid anymore and so on. Okay? We just need to share a way that allows one server to create uh, the signature and the other to verify the signature. And this is typically done with a, with a secret a key, okay? I, in some form, okay? Okay, and so today we will try to use one of the most uh, used mechanisms in this context, which is the, this uh, JSON Web Token, okay? Uh, abbreviated as JWT, JWT, okay? It's standardized, most of these things are standardized uh, in the sense that uh, uh, they they say that if you would like to encode this set of characters, a string that represents uh, an object, uh, like a JSON object, uh, a JSON string, and, and uh, a valid JSON string. Uh, okay, you should uh, write this part, uh, that is uh, how do you encode this stuff, uh, the payload, and then uh, the signature, and you should use this algorithm in this way, and so on, okay? Um, <coughs> What is uh, nice about uh, this uh, web JSON web tokens or JWT is that uh, basically they are uh, only a, 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 a long string, okay? Uh, encoded in a URL friendly way, it means there are not no strange characters, no binary characters, and so on. Okay, it's uh, just just a string that you could even type, okay? And can contain any payload in general. It's not restricted to a certain payload. Okay, certain format and so on. Uh, <coughs> of course, there are recommendations, but basically you can put whatever you want inside. Uh, just a, a set of characters, okay? And since they are converted in your friendly string format, means uh, avoiding all strange uh, characters, okay? Only alphabetic, uh, numeric, and so on. Um, you can put whatever you want in the payload. Um, typically, you will store authorization information. For instance, the authorization level. You are the, a regular user or you are an admin user. You are a, 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 a user on the free tier or you have, a, let's say, a more advanced plan or you have the most expensive plan, okay? That's more or less the authorization level for, for a users in some you know, in, in just an, as an example. Or maybe it's a more detailed information. Uh, you can access only this endpoint uh, or this, uh, uh, this set of information and not the rest and so on, okay? In a complex uh, structured information and so on, okay? So we just need to be careful because uh, uh, if we use a token for authorization purposes, there are uh, uh, two pieces of information as, as a minimum that we should include. One is uh, the information about the permissions that we have. That could be also very simple, as I told you. I'm a regular user, I'm an admin user, okay? So role, you, uh, role normal, role admin, okay? For instance. Uh, and an expiration timestamp, okay? I need to say that at a certain point, this, uh, um, this token is not valid anymore. Otherwise, it would be uh, like uh, if I give you a, a blank check with the signature, I give it to you, no expiration date, you can use it wherever, whenever you like, and I don't know what it will happen, okay? If I know that a certain, at a certain time it will expire, uh, I know that uh, after that date, that, that um, authorization that I gave uh, is not valid anymore. That's exactly what happens uh, in the real world with any, I mean, meaningful system that gives authorization. You have your library card enabled for, I don't know, one year, two years, and so on. Okay, it's not forever. You have an ID card in your pocket, probably, uh, that has an expiration date. It's a token, okay? Uh, it includes information that basically has been signed by the government about you. Okay, uh, in the old days was uh, like, uh, uh, you know, it was difficult to counterfeit because of it was paper and uh, there was the signature and the stamp uh, of the office and nowadays it's digital, so there's actually a digital signature as well, okay? 
So it's basically a token. It's not something that we can you know, transmit on the, on the network, but the idea is exactly the same. And indeed, it has an expiration date. OK? Uh, an example. This is actually a JWT token. Uh, so a JWT token is split into three parts. So it's a big string, long string, which is split in, in three parts by two dots. Okay, so dot is a special character then. The first part says, uh, which is the algorithm that has been used to generate uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the token. So it's a JWT and certain algorithm for the signature, uh, for, for the hash and so on, okay? But we, do, we shouldn't uh, really care too much about these uh, details, but only about the payload that is the one that we decide. The rest is basically decided by the available formats in JWT. We will use a library, so the library will create it for us. And then there's the payload. And here we decide what to put in the payload. For instance, uh, the access level, that is basically an authorization. I'm a premium user, I'm a normal user, I'm a, an administrator, whatever. Okay? For instance, it could be more complex uh, information. And then an expiration date time. The JVT recommends to use this number, that's basically a number of seconds since, uh, you know, 1st January uh, 1970. That is very widely used in, uh, you know, Unix uh, uh, um, uh, environments, um, uh, which is uh, 1 billion, 7 uh, million, 700 million, etc. Okay. So it's just a way to represent a date in a compact format uh, and, uh, in a way that is uh, convenient for the computer. And then the, this uh, field is not really mandatory. It's issued at, okay, so when the tokens was created. But actually, it's not really needed because once the token exists, you can, it can be used, okay? And then there's a signature. And this is a, a critique cryptographic signature, okay? So it cannot be counterfeit, counterfeited, um, so it cannot be forged unless you know some secret information that has been used in generating the signature, okay? Typically, it's a secure hash function that includes a secret information, okay? And all the rest of the data. But I mean, we don't really care about this stuff. This stuff is about more is more about cryptography. Okay, finding a good way to you know to to create signatures, and you should already be expert, probably more than me, in these things. Okay. Um, note that you can read the content, so the content is clear text. I mean, it looks encrypted, but it's actually just transformed with a reversible transform. If you go to this website. Uh, jwt.io. It just works locally. I mean, doesn't send anything to the server. It's just a JavaScript application that runs in the browser, just for convenience. And you do copy and paste of this uh, string. Okay, let's try. Uh, okay. I just did copy and paste. You see that. Uh, well, the first part is actually always the same if you always use the same algorithm and so on and the same format. The second part contains uh, uh, the payload. And you see, it, it, it has extracted the payload that was here, actually the one that I encoded. And it also works uh, both ways. You can edit things, uh, okay? <laughs> and it, it, it gives you the um, uh, encoded payload. Okay, and then there's a place for the signature, but uh, I mean, we will generate the signature with the library also because you need to type a secret here, okay, and decide how to interpret it and so on, okay. Or just, uh, you know, a convenient, a, a convenience um, website that you can use uh, to check the content of a, a token in case you need to debug something, okay, because you cannot really uh, read inside the token uh, directly, okay. Uh, okay, so 
What's the advantage of using uh, a token like a JVT token? Well, actually, with any, as with any other token, once I check the signature, I'm sure that the authorization is valid. As your colleague was saying before, it needs to be ke uh, kept secret because anybody arriving with this uh, uh, token uh, can, is authorized to, uh, you know, uh, um, to, to perform the action that, uh, that the token allows. It's like more or less the, the keys of your car, okay? Anybody who has the key can enter the car and, and turn it on and drive away, okay? But the, in the key, in modern keys, there's an electronic uh, uh, device that basically has some secret, so it's a sort of signature that the car recognizes before you turn it on, okay? Uh, and actually, that's, uh, that's nice because once you have the token, there's no need for any other information except the ability of verifying the signature. And the rest is written in the payload, okay? And so this is very well suited for stateless APIs that receive a single request and might, must provide an answer. So with a session, that means uh, a server that has a session, that means that we need to have multiple interactions, at least one interaction to be um, authenticated. So I provide login password and they give me a session ID. And the second interaction to ask whatever I need, if I'm authorized or not, the server will check and do the things, okay? With this approach, with the token approach, one single interaction with the server is enough because they send the request and together with the request, they send the token. Of course, on a secure channel, it needs to be a secure channel, otherwise, if somebody steals the token, okay, can, can reply the request. But this applies also to the session ID case. Um, there is no need to contact or to communicate with the entity that provided the JVT at runtime. So, typically the authentication server, where I first authenticated, okay? Uh, of course you could do it, but then you are back to the case of the session ID, or you are back to a case in which you have session IDs that needs to be shared between servers. So it's a more difficult uh, setup, okay? Uh, there are also uh, disadvantages. One of the most important disadvantages is that once you have a token, Make it invalid before the expiration date is difficult, okay? Basically, there's no way. It's like, uh, how do I make your key car invalid? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I can destroy it, but the string information, you know, information can be copied, so <laughs> it cannot, it's not a physical object, okay? Um, and so basically you should say, well, I change the way in which I sign the token, but in this way, I will make all tokens invalid, okay? Not just one, all of them. Or I need to have a, like a blacklist of tokens. And uh, uh, if it's in the blacklist or in the white list, depends on how you would like to implement it, uh, uh, you might uh, deny access to certain tokens. But in this case, again, you need to keep information on the server. That is the, uh, the starting point that we would like to avoid. Okay, so in general, tokens are difficult to make invalid sooner than expiration date time. So for this reason, it is better to have a short expiration date time. So not uh, days, months, years, okay? But typically, you're talking about minutes, maybe hours, okay? And then, what if uh, the authorization is still needed after the expiration date time? Well, before it expires, you ask for a new token, okay? With a, another expiration date time, you forget about the first one that will expire soon. And that's actually the way in which many, many aut authorization systems work in our day. For instance, uh, like the OAuth 2, that is very common and implemented uh, a lot uh, around, uh, works in this way. There are two tokens. There's the actual uh, 
uh, access token, and that's a second token, a refresh token that ask you that allows you to ask for a new access token. Okay, so the refresh token is not used uh, so often, so it can be protected more in a certain sense because it doesn't need to travel for each request, while the actual uh, access token uh, travels with every request, for instance. Okay, so uh, this is the picture for JWTs, so for tokens in general and especially for the JWT. In practice, as your colleague mentioned before, this must be kept secret, but in any case, as we would do with the session ID. Just in our toy examples during the, this course, we will not keep it uh, uh, secret in the sense that communication channel is not encrypted because we need to debug and see things, understand how things work, and we work uh, on localhost and so on, and we don't have anything to protect, actually, just, you know, toy examples, okay? We are not using an ba actual bank account, okay? Uh, uh, the token must be sent for each request, of course, it's like the session ID, okay? And the server receiving the token must have a method to validate the legitimacy of the JVT. And actually, this depends on how the signature is implemented. This is just a few more slides uh, with more technical details. Uh, basically, once you need to sign something, uh, you know, from cryptography, from the cryptography science, let's say, uh, you basically today have two approaches. Either you have a single secret key, and both entities know the secret key, so it's a symmetric algorithm, in a, even though they talk about symmetric algorithms in encryption, not really in signature, but I mean, both entities know uh, the same secret, or you can use a, a scheme like a public-private key, which I hope you know what it is, okay? So there's a, one of the key, uh, a part of the key, the public key, that can be used to verify things that doesn't need to be seg secret. It's public indeed. And there's a, the private key that needs to be kept secret because that's the one that is used to sign, okay? And anybody who has that part can sign anything, okay? For simplicity, but just for simplicity, we will use the first approach, the single secret key, okay? So a, a secret value that we copy and paste easily in our code, okay? But just for simplicity, of course, if you go to a, a, a production environment where things should, you know, be safe, secure, and so on, you need to, you know, address this point and decide what's better for your application. Um, yeah, that's the, the, what, I, what I told you, okay? Of course, uh, uh, the, the key is used for signing and for verifying in case you use a symmetric algorithm, so the same secret must be kept secret as well, okay? But actually, uh, these values don't need to travel over the network. They can be shared uh, uh, once uh, in some secure way, and that's all, while while the session IDs and the token will travel over the network, okay? And so those needs uh, to be protected well, okay? While the rest is at the uh, startup, okay? You know, when you start up the services, uh, you need to distribute those keys in a secure way, but that's all. Okay, so let's come to the practical part. How do we implement a scheme like this? Uh, after that, we understood this could be useful for our web applications. And as I told you, actually, it's very much used, okay? Uh, you use a lot these schemes like the OAuth 2 and so on, all based on tokens, okay? Uh, <coughs> so, my recommendation, actually, uh, the teacher's recommendations for this course is just create an endpoint, so an API, that after you check the authorization of the user, can give a token, okay? An authorization token. Depending on what you would like to implement, you need to decide then what to write in the payload, okay? Uh, the application receive it and store it in the application memory. So since we have React application, it means storing into a React state 
in JavaScript code. Okay? Uh, and note, this uh, will not be set as a cookie, okay? Uh, because we will need to send it to another domain, which is not possible with cookies, okay? Well, actually, we could store it as a, as a cookie, but we cannot make it a HTTP only, so not accessible j by JavaScript, because then we need to take it with JavaScript and send it explicitly with a fetch in JavaScript when, you f when we fetch towards another server, okay? So there's no point in storing it as a cookie, in short, okay? And note, this, this approach will not create a session. Each request will be independent from any other request. Okay? The session is just something that has been built over HTTP. The basic HTTP has no session. Okay? And this is fine, because we send a request and we get a response. Either we are authorized, we get the information, or we are not authorized, we don't get the information. We perform the action, I mean, depends on what we would like to do. Okay, so okay, let's come to the practical part. There are, as usual, many libraries available. Let's try to stick with the, uh, the most uh, used ones and the most useful ones, okay? Most uh, well-implemented ones. Uh, there are two libraries. One is uh, to, uh, ha to create a middleware that basically is able to check the token when a request arrives at the server. And the other is a, a library that allows you to create and verify uh, the tokens. So you say, I would like to have this payload, assign it uh, with, the, with the signature, and the secret is this, uh, and it gives me back uh, the string, the, you know, the ugly string that we saw before, this stuff, okay? And then you have it, you, you send it back uh, in, the, in the API that uh, gives the, the authorization token. And uh, uh, on the other side, in the other server, you receive the, receive the token and you will need to verify the signature and then take the payload and, and use it. So, as usual, all these middlewares have uh, a configuration options uh, let's have a look at the most important options and then we will try to code things. Uh, well, of course, uh, you need to have this secret, okay? A sufficiently long random string needed to uh, verify the signature. In this case, it's just for verification because this is the middleware for the receiving part, for the server that receives the token. Uh, an algorithm that can be used uh, to to, you know, that is allowed uh, to be used uh, for, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, it's a valid algorithm for our token, okay, in short. This is just because there are many algorithms and maybe there are some algorithms you, don't, you wouldn't like to use because uh, they have been uh, um, uh, discovered to be weak, okay, over time. So you can basically only list uh, algorithms that uh, you deem uh, secure enough for your applications, okay? Uh, credential required optionally false uh, basically allows the request to pass through the middleware even if the token is not present. And uh, it means that there will be a way to check uh, if the token is present or not later, okay? Otherwise, the middleware simply stops the request and doesn't call the, the next middlewares uh, and uh, your your API will not even have to deal with the request because it's stopped before by the middleware, okay? It's like when we put the is logged in uh, that we did on Monday on, on the list of middlewares of an API. If e the is logged in is not passed, the rest is not executed, simply not executed, okay? And this function get token optional uh, is to extract a token from the HTTP request, but we will use a method for which uh, the default is fine. So an additional HTTP header. That is actually this header, which is quite st standard nowadays. So authentication colon and the rest of the header, which will be, we will see the example, bearer and the value of the token, okay? And then there's the other library where basically you have just one function that needs to be used. A dot sign, the payload, 
So the object, you put a JavaScript object, they serialize it as a JSON, in very, I mean, the, in the most compact way, in characters, JSON characters, and then this uh, secret value and uh, a set of options. Uh, uh, yeah, one is important, that is the expire scene, because it decides, uh, you know, the expiration date. And typically, you will put a value like one minute, two minutes, or ten minutes, uh, one hour, something like this. Okay? Because we say it's short usually. Okay? You can even create a token without uh, a expiration date. But as I told you, uh, it's not recommended because uh, it is valid forever. Okay? Until you change the secret, so it cannot be easily. Uh, Tokens in general cannot be easily revoked, so made invalid. Um, okay, there are other methods, but they are used by the middleware, so we'll not uh, automatically and we'll not uh, see them here. So, how do we implement all this stuff? Oh. No, well, okay. Nothing serious. I mean, just the server one, two, and so on was different column, but it went back, I think. Okay. Uh, basically, in the server that issues the token, we just uh, need to have the secret, okay? Remember this secret that needs to be long enough, I just changed, <laughs> put some characters, I mean, it needs to be as long, uh, at the minimum, as long as the signature, okay? Because they are basically using a hash function to, to create the signature, okay, with the secret value. Uh, so don't use a, a very short string, okay? Because uh, it will make uh, the signature weaker. And uh, in the server that re verifies the token, you import the other mid the, the other library that is the middleware, but you have the same secret, okay? Uh, we chose uh, to uh, have the secret embedded into the code, which is not the best way to deal with this. Uh, um, um, this vi these values, these secret values, because anybody who has access to the code can, uh, um, you know, look at the code and see the value and use it to, to forge uh, uh, tokens, okay? Uh, again, this is done only for simplicity, only in this course. But, I mean, this is a, a, a bigger uh, discussion that we should do, or you should do probably, in the course of study. I mean, how, where to put uh, secret information when you deploy um, applications, you deploy softwares and so on, okay? You cannot leave it into the code, but because then we will uh, commit it on GitHub <laughs> and see it on GitHub, and if it's a public uh, uh, project, um, like an open source project and so on, you forget the secret there and so on, it's, it's a lot of problems, okay? But for this very simple case, uh, uh, we will use uh, this approach. I mean, just a constant into the code, okay? When you go in a, in a really uh, well-designed environment, there is a mechanism to provide secrets to applications, typically in the form of environment variables or even internal services. Like if you take Amazon AWS, for instance, cloud services and so on, they have uh, a, a way in which you can configure the secrets and distribute securely to your applications without putting them into the code, okay? Then we need to have a route that generates the token. It means an API on the server where we perform the, the authorization, so the login, okay? There should be an additional API, like uh, get uh, the authentication token. Of course, only if we are logged in. That's a typical situation. Of course, I can provide token to anybody, but if I provide token to anybody, I mean, the utility of the token is a bit uh, uh, diminished, okay? So, uh, I don't want to say it's useless, but uh, it's more or less like a public service. You just need to do an additional call to a server to get a token that is, that is given to anybody, even not authenticated user, and then you go, and ask for the service with the token. So you can avoid using the token <laughs> in short, okay? So if the user is logged in, uh, we decide what to put into the payload. So this payload to sign is what we put inside. 
And often this information comes from a storage like the database. There's an administration, uh, uh, admin, uh, an administrator, like a user which has a role which is the administrator, and a user which is a normal user, and the user that has additional uh, possibilities in terms of authorization, like uh, it can review code, but it, it cannot delete projects and so on. These are all uh, authorization levels. Or maybe just uh, like here, a level like uh, you are uh, uh, the, the free, not paying user, or you are, let's say, the, in the middle tier, or you are in the, um, what's the, the, exam? the premium tier, okay, for your service and so on, okay? And then, simply, you sign it with a secret, with an expiration time. In this example, we will play with 60 seconds, which is actually the minimum uh, allowed by the library, unless you modify the library. Okay, just because it doesn't make sense to have a token that expires in one second. <laughs> okay, I mean, it should span at least a few seconds because it, it, it must be, uh, you must be able to use it. Okay, and then how do you return it to the application? Well, as a JSON, no problem. I mean, as any other information that we get from the server. Okay, so an object with a field token and we, with the value of the token, okay? Then, uh, in the application, we get the token, as usual. We write an API for the client, where there's a fetch that goes to the URL of the server and fetch the token. Credential is include, remember, as we saw on Monday, because this is a, a, a request that comes with the, the cookie that shows that you have uh, uh, authenticated before. And then, as usual, response JSON and so on, set out token, that means we put it into a state, a React state, as the, all the other information that comes from the server, okay? What's the only difference is that the token will not be shown in the interface, it's just kept inside the memory of the client application. But like the user ID, for instance, you typically don't show the user ID, but you have the user ID in the memory of the application in a, in a React state and so on. Okay, and then, and then you need to send it. So that's another fetch. That's a different server. That's why I, I put it here as an example, Three, uh, 3002, not 3001 that was the other server. It's another server. In an actual context, we, it might be a different host, as we saw before, okay? It was a stock.bank.com, or what was the, the URL? Yeah, stockbank.com, okay? Instead of apibank.com and so on, okay? Can be wherever. In, in the in the network, um, and how do I include the token? That's a standard way of including the token as an HTTP header, authorization uh, bearer, and the value. Okay, there are different values here that one can use. We will not see all these values. There are different authentication methods because over time there have been a lot of authentication methods that have been developed uh, uh, for HTTP, okay? Uh, we will only see this one, okay? Um, <coughs> and, then, and then you get the answer. And the answer, we will get it into the JSON format. Why should we change, okay? Just for our course, of course, uh, just for simplicity, we already have a format to transfer information. Why we should, we, I mean, we don't have a reason to change, okay? Uh, JSON is very convenient, also we are very uh, used in actual applications, in deployed applications uh, all over the world, okay? And so the last piece of information you need is how to protect APIs, okay? So, uh, we saw on Monday for the session, we need to have a, a middleware. He is logged in in the middleware chain for each API we would like to protect. We just uh, make uh, app use like here and protect all of them. 
uh, here, well, we typically would like to protect all of them. So we, you, we create the middleware at uh, up level and use it at up level. And we just need to provide the secret because the secret is the one which is needed to verify the signature, okay? And the rest is automatically done by the library. So basically the library takes the JSON web token and goes and check uh, the last part of the signature. It computes the signature from the first uh, and second uh, part of the JWT token. And it checks if it matches with the third part of the token, okay? If it matches, no problem. Otherwise, uh, uh, we will not enter into the rest of the code that we wrote here, okay? Without a valid token, an error will be raised automatically by the uh, middleware, okay? So the middleware will make res uh, uh, 401, unauthorized, okay? Putting some JSON saying, I don't know, invalid token or whatever, okay? And actually you can, you can uh, uh, change this behavior with a specific function, okay? Uh, if uh, there's an error and the error name is uh, unauthorized error, which is the name used by this middleware to check tokens, you can do whatever you like, okay? I just created an error which is similar to the express validator just for convenience on the client application in case we need it. Uh, we have the same format, okay? But this is not really needed. I mean, you can stick with the default uh, uh, function, so you, you don't need to write anything in this case. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's last last piece of uh, information to write code. How do we access the payload? Because okay, that's a valid token. The, va the signature has been verified; it's valid, so we can use the token. Remember, we don't have information on the server because there's no session. The information is in the payload. How can I access the payload in the request? Well, you remember that we had a REC user in the sessions to access information that was local in the server. Here we have REC out. That is the information that has been encoded in the JSON payload, in the JWT payload, okay? And then you can check whatever you would like to check in that uh, token, okay? So, uh, if in server one, so the one who created the token, you use the, an object with a name, uh, uh, with a, a key access and a value premium, in rec.out.access, you will find the string premium, okay? If this token has been sent to the other server, okay? After checking the signature, everything is fine, we can access the payload. And if the payload is uh, an object, so the curly bracket here starts an object, you can basically have access to an object. Rec out an object is an object and you can access fields in this object, okay? That's the recommended way of uh, designing the payload for a token, okay? Um, and then what do you do with this value? It depends on the application. It's premium, okay, go into the database and uh, retrieve the information about uh, what is required here, the stock uh, exchange data, whatever we said, okay? Uh, it's not premium, it's a normal user where I give uh, less information. I give uh, just uh, the, 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 the stock exchange index and not the single values for each stock, for instance, whatever you want, but it depends on the application. It depends on how you designed this endpoint on the server, okay? Um, <coughs> you can even perform not just retrieval, but even store information and so on. You're not just limited to get uh, uh, HTTP methods. Okay, you can use post, put, delete, whatever you want, okay? Because the request uh, is authorized with the token, okay? So if they provide, if they provided you a token, in the token they can write whatever they like, and you need to check 
if what is written in the token allows you to perform the action you should do in this endpoint. If, it's, if uh, the answer is true, you just do it, okay, without problems. Uh, otherwise, you refuse to do it. Of course, you can still refuse to do things, okay? If I just simply write uh, rec status uh, 401, I mean, uh, even if the token has been checked and uh, everything was fine from the point of view of the token, signature plus expiration date, I, I can decide not to authorize the request because maybe I would like to have, uh, I don't know, only premium uh, users uh, for a certain uh, a function, okay, for a certain API and so on. Uh, so if it's not premium, I just return with, with, other, with another error code, okay? Uh, okay, just last recommendation and we will break for the, for 10 minutes, maybe 15. Today we should be shorter, uh, I mean, than usual. In general, remember, as usual, authorization is a complex problem, but you have a whole course of study, right? You are, you are, you are on the cybersecurity course of study, so these uh, problems are always complex. That's a whole course of study dealing with this problem. This is just one part of them, but authorization, like authentication and so on, are complex problems. So, as I told you on Monday, never invent your own mechanism or just use standardized, well-tested systems, okay? At least for now, okay, you're still studying. And then you will go out, hopefully you, you get your degree, you go out to work for companies and so on. Be familiar with the system, uh, create some experience, okay? Let's uh, experience a little bit what's, what's happening around. Uh, let's see how things work and so on. And then after a while, maybe you can start thinking about how could improve, okay, what's, what's, uh, uh, what is done uh, in, in actual applications, like in this context, uh, uh, um, authentication, authorization, and so on. And remember, you typically don't work alone, okay, because more brains uh, think better than just one single brain, okay? But also because you can discuss with colleagues and so on and come up with some, you know, reasonably good solution. But in general, typically, these uh, solutions need to be well tested, well understood and so on. So typically, if they are good, they become a standard. So there's no need to invent things. There's just the need to, uh, uh, you know, use it the right standard for your case. So first of all, know which are the possibilities, identify the good standard for your case, the, good, the best practice for your case, understand it very well, configure it very well, and make it work in your system. Usually everything is uh, almost ready for your case, okay? Uh, it's, it's really, really unusual that there is something which is not uh, uh, suitable for your case. Okay, so try not to invent anything. While, while you are developing an application, you need a new element and so on, a graphical user interface that does something and so on, you can try and design something. Never do that in authentication, authorization, and security uh, context, because it's very, 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 very easy to get things wrong. You know, there are so many possible attacks and ways to attack and so on. So try to avoid uh, designing things until you are very, very, very expert, but at that point as well, probably you will not do it alone, okay? So you need to discuss with others, experts like you in the field. Okay, so let's have a break, 10 minutes break, and then afterwards we will implement something with this approach. Okay. <coughs> 